preached to a congregation under the canopy of the gospel tent in 1965. The message is timeless. God's calendar has two days. Our speaker, evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. I'm speaking tonight on the subject, God's calendar has only two days. Our calendar has Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Our year has 365 days in it. Some of our months have 30 days, some 31, one 28, and sometimes 29. God has a calendar, and God's calendar has only two days. Now, to whet your appetite, I ask, night after night, as I announce this subject, does God honor Saturday or Sunday or Monday or Wednesday or Tuesday or Friday or Thursday? Which two days does God honor and which two days does God's calendar possess or which two days make up God's calendar? Now, of course, as we go along and read the Word of God, you'll understand what I mean and why I announce the subject God's calendar has only two days. Let me quote two or three verses. I won't ask you to turn. I'd rather you wouldn't turn, because if you do, you're going to lose the place, and then when I get ready to read, you won't be there. There is a question among skeptics and infidels and some people who like to be noticed, and they don't know how to be noticed unless they uh, talk religion and declare that they're an agnostic or some kind of a free thinker, and they ask the question, where did God come from? How many of you people know where God came from? Raise your hand. Well, this is an ignorant bunch I have tonight. Amen. Please smile. If you don't want to... Fellas, empty those offering cups right quick. I'm going to take another offering. Amen. I tell you, when I have to do all the preaching, say all the amens, and do all the smiling, and all the laughing, and all the jumping, and all the hollering, I take two offerings. I get time and half time. I'm not going to work overtime for the same price. How many of you people know where God came from? Raise your hand. You're still an ignorant bunch. How many of you think you know where God came from? Raise your hand high. Well, there's a, there are a few folks thinking. If some atheist, if some free thinker, if some agnostic should come to your door and say, where did God come from? What would you say? Hey, what? Well, why didn't you raise your hand when I asked you? God didn't come from anywhere. There has never been a time when God was not. You believe that? Say You say, explain that. I don't have to explain it. God said it and that settles it. In the beginning, what? Say it. God. So when some atheist, agnostic, free thinker, when some smart aleck asks you where God came from, you just say God had no beginning. In the beginning, God was already in the beginning. Is that right? Say it. So that's just as good an answer as you, as you can give anyone, and that is the Bible answer. In the beginning, God. All right. Now then, God does not deal with... In yesterday, God does not deal in tomorrow. Now, that's the thing that damned Pharaoh, and that's the thing that caused Pharaoh to drown on the bottom of the Red Sea, uh, uh, the bottom uh, of the Red Sea, uh, when God rolled back the waters and Israel went through dry shod, and Pharaoh and his armies entered, and of course, you know, they were drowned, all of them. You remember, God sent ten plagues, and Moses said, let my people go. God said, let my people go. And every time, Pharaoh said, in essence, if he didn't literally speak the word, he said, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. God knows no tomorrow. God knows no yesterdays. God lives and deals and operates in the eternal today. A day is as a thousand years with whom? Said. The Lord, and a, a, a day is as a thousand years of the Lord, and a, a thousand years as one day. Now, God knows only two days, and here they are. Today, 
That's the first day on God's calendar today. And Jesus Christ the same today that he was yesterday and that he will be on all the tomorrow, today. God has, number one, the first day on God's calendar is today. And the only other day on God's calendar is that day. And I'll show you what that day means and what that day consists of. But first of all, today. If you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if you have your Bibles open quickly, please, we read just one verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. For he saith, I have heard thee in the time accepted, and in the day, D-A-Y, day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, how many of you have your Bibles open? Raise your hand. You have your Bibles open? Many of you are returning, and that's all right. That's fine. I'm going to read it again. And I think now most of you, certainly most of you have the place. And I want you to read, and read with me and watch it. And here it is. For he saith, that is, the Lord God Almighty saith, I have heard thee in the time accepted, and in the day, D-A-Y, singular, in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now watch this. Behold, now. Not 60 minutes from now. Not tonight when I give the invitation. Not Sunday. Not tonight at midnight. Not when you get home. But now is the day. Now God deals in the eternal present. Now is the day of salvation. So, today is the day of salvation. And now is the accepted time. And if you hear the voice of God, harden not your heart. Now let's deal with that just a few minutes. I have a little pamphlet. How many of you, I, maybe I shouldn't ask this, but I'd like to know. Because we've had some very interesting reports of conversions. In fact, we've had more people saved through that little pamphlet, 32-page booklet, have you signed up to go to hell? We've had more people saved through that than any other piece of literature we've ever mailed out except the Believe Trash, the 16-page, what does it mean to believe under salvation? How many of you people wrote into the Gospel Hour and received copies of the booklet, have you signed up to go to hell? Raise your hand. Did you get those? Well, there are a few. God bless you. Now, that 32-page booklet has on the front cover, have you signed up? That's all there is. It's black. The cover is black. The letters are white. There's no name, there is no suggestion that it's the gospel. Listen, beloved, when you give a sinner a tract with a Bible on the front, or a cross on the front, or some wording on the front to suggest to that sinner that this is an invitation to be saved, sometimes they throw it down, they lay it down, they never read it. But when a man gets a pamphlet or a booklet in the mail, and he opens it, and he looks on the cover, and he sees the words, have you signed up? He's going to look inside to see what he's going to sign up for because he may think that somebody's giving away a Cadillac. Amen. Or a hundred free green stamps. You'd be surprised if folks would drive 40 miles to buy a broom to get 50 green stamps free when they could buy the same broom next door for a quarter less. Amen. That's right. That's the American people. But when a man sees a booklet and on the front cover, have you signed up? He's going to look inside. And on the inside, in big red letters, have you signed up to go to hell? Now let me show you something here and then we'll move on quickly. The devil, listen to me, look at me and, and look at me now and I'll tell you when to look at your Bible. The devil is too wise, too smart, too shrewd, and too cunning to ask any man to sign a contract Never to be saved. He just wants you to give him one sermon, one altar call, one invitation stanza, and one service at a time. And if you'll give him this service, he's not worried about tomorrow night. There are 10,000 ways you can go to hell before tomorrow night. Today's the day. But now wait. According to my watch, it's 20 minutes, about 20 minutes until 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 20 till 9, 21 till 9 in that neighborhood. There are three hours and 20 minutes left in this day. 
This day started last night at midnight. There are 24 hours in a day. There are 60 minutes in an hour. There are 60 seconds in a minute. And it doesn't take 60 seconds for you to die and go to hell. So the Bible says today's the day, but it narrows it down to now. Right now is the accepted time. Some of you folks attended the Williamsport meeting. I could stand here for a solid hour and tell you about Casey in Rocky Mount, Goldsboro, Henderson, Greenville, South Carolina, Williamsport, and other places where people have dropped dead in my tent or dropped dead immediately after they left the tent or they've gone out to meet God before they ever reached home. I'm thinking of a man over in Williamsport. He and his precious wife came in from Philadelphia. I can see them now. They sat on the second bench. They looked straight up in my face the whole time I preached. I didn't know it, but they had the room in the same motel where I was. They had the room next to me. And they sat in the tent and they listened to the sermon. And we had a big crowd that night. They didn't come up and speak to me. They went on to the motel because they were tired. And the next morning, just before 7 o'clock, I stepped out the motel door and I was going to the automobile waiting for my wife and David. We were going down to the restaurant to get breakfast and I heard a lady scream and the door next to my door came open and a lady ran out of the room screaming, Get a doctor! Get a doctor! Get a doctor! And I rushed to the motel office and I told the lady in the office, call a doctor. There's a man grievously sick in the room next to me. And she called the doctor and I rushed back to the room. And that poor woman was down over that man with her mouth over his mouth, trying to get in mouth to mouth respiration, trying to get breath back in his lungs. And I picked up his arm. I felt of his pulse. I listened to his heart. And I didn't say a thing to that precious lady, but I knew she didn't need a doctor. She needed an undertaker. That man drove his automobile from Philadelphia to Williamsport, spent, came to my meeting, sat in the meeting, enjoyed the meeting, went home, went to bed, healthy, feeling good, on a trip, going on a vacation, went to bed that night and slept all night. And the next morning when he sat up in bed and put his feet out of the bed to put his trousers on, he fell over in the floor dead. There's a golf course just a stone's throw from my house. And just a couple of days before we left home, a lot of you fellows, I'm sure, play golf, or at least some of you do. This 41-year-old businessman, 41, I'm 50, nine years older than he, 41 years old, walked out and fixed his ball and was out there to get some fresh air. The the golf course is right at the foot of a little mountain. We live in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. We live only 30 miles from Asheville, so we're in the hilly part of our state, and this golf course is out there at the foot of Paris Mountain. And this man's gone out there to breathe some good fresh mountain air, gone out to get some sunshine, gone out to relax to get away from the office, to get away from the nerve-wracking grind, and he put his ball in the position, and he took his club in his hand, and he raised back to hit the ball, and dropped dead. Listen, brother, the only safe way to live today is to live exactly like you want to be living when you die. Folks die with their shoes on today. But you can't frighten me. I'm not trying to frighten you. I'm trying to hold the naked, unvarnished truth before your eyes. And if you're not saved, if you're not washed in the blood, if you're not born again, you have much to be frightened about. And you need to wake up before you wake up hell fire. Today's the day. 
But there are 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. And it doesn't take but about five of those seconds for you to drop dead and go to hell if you're not saved. Is that right or wrong? Answer me, say. That's right. Now, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. And I want you to listen fast because I'm going fast. And I'm not going to repeat and I'm not going back. And I want you to hear what I'm going to say and I want you to respond. How many folks in this church tonight are just as cheerfully go to hell as go to heaven and it doesn't make any difference to you if you do go to hell? Raise your hand. You just as soon go to hell as not. Put your hand up. I didn't expect any hand. I've quoted the verse, I guess, in almost every sermon I've preached you. I know I've used it a couple of times. We read in 1 John 5, 10, He that believeth, hath the witness in himself. He that believeth the record that God hath given of his Son, he that believeth the record that God hath given concerning the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus for sinners, he that believeth hath the witness in himself. Is that Bible say? Here's another verse, Romans 8, 9, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's not of his. Here's another verse. Romans 8, 16, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Is that right? Say, here's another verse, 1 John 3, 14, we know, we know, we know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. Is that scripture? Say, huh? All right, I'm going to ask you one more time. How many of you folks don't care if you go to hell? You're just soon go to hell as anywhere else. It doesn't make one bit of difference to you if you go to hell. Put your hand up. It just don't matter. All right, I'm going to ask you another question. Listen very carefully and answer quickly. How many of you know as surely, as truly, and as positively as you know you're breathing? You know you're saved as truly as you know you're breathing. Raise your hand, huh? All right, take it down. You say, preacher, you didn't even look. I didn't want to look. I didn't ask you to do that for my benefit. I asked you to do that for your benefit. And if you don't know that you're saved just as truly and just as surely as you know you're breathing, I'd hate to die with your brand of religion. You say, preacher, I don't think anybody knows it. You must have thought that you didn't get it out of the Bible. There are a lot of things I don't know. There are a lot of things about the Bible I don't know. There are a lot of things about the Bible I don't understand. There are a lot of things about the Bible I'll never understand. If there's one thing I know, 31 years ago, I was a wretched, miserable, lost, hell-bound sinner and I put my trust in Jesus Christ, and he saved my soul, and I've never doubted it. So help me, God, I've never doubted it. That's one thing I know. Now, you listen to me. You say, Green, you're trying to make me doubt my salvation. If I can make you doubt it, you don't have any. Now, you listen to me. I can carry you to Greenville County, to the Laurel Creek community, and even though they've done away with the old church, the old building where I was saved, I can carry you within three or four square feet of the place that God saved me. I know the time on the watch, 9.15 p.m. I know the day of the week, Sunday! I know the month of the year, the year of the century. And I've never forgotten it. Now, I'm not demanding that of you. You say, preacher, I don't remember whether it was Saturday night or Friday night or Monday night. I don't remember whether it was 1935, 39, 41, 46. 
I don't remember whether it was 8 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, or 11 o'clock at night. That may be true. I'm not demanding that you remember the time on the watch, the day of the week, or the date of the calendar, or even the year of the century. I'm not demanding that. But I'm saying, if you don't remember a distinct, positive experience when you met God and God saved you, you better get one. You better get one. Don't tell me God saved you and you don't know it. Don't tell me God took out an old heart and put in a new heart and you don't know it. Don't tell me the Holy Ghost abides in your bosom and you don't know it. If you're born again, you know it. Now, today, now I said, the devil never has asked a man. And the devil never has asked a woman to sign a contract to go to hell. The devil, if you're a sinner, if you're lost, if you're on the road to hell, and you get under conviction tonight, the devil will sit right down beside you and put his arm around you and agree with you that you should get saved, but not tonight. The devil never has told any man that he should never get saved. He's too wise. He's too shrewd. He's cunning. Don't ever let anybody tell you he looks like this picture on a red devil I can. Of course, we don't have, I don't think we do. I haven't seen it in many years. You ever seen a red devil I can? Raise your hand. Ever seen one? He don't look like that. The devil doesn't have a forked tail and a red hot pitchfork. He can't operate as a roaring lion, and he can't operate as a shining angel, right? Say, huh? And the way that he can most effectively deal with you to damn you, that's the way he'll deal with you. Now look up here at me just a minute. And I got to move. If you're here tonight, and you're not saved, you plan to be saved, you intend to be saved. And if I've heard this one time, I've heard it a thousand in 30 years. Mr. Green, don't worry about me. I'm going to get saved. That's all the devil wants to hear you say. That's all he wants to hear you say. Don't worry about me, Preacher Green. Don't worry about me. I'm going to get saved. You're going to hell. That's what you're going to do. You better come to yourself, come to your senses, and come to Jesus now, right now. Proverbs 27, 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what the day may bring. And then I'll have to suggest this, and then I'll move to that day. I'm talking about today now. You say, Mr. Green, and I've had this. And I wouldn't be too sure there isn't somebody here tonight. If you told the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so happy God, you'd stand up and say, Mr. Green, I've already thought it. Didn't say it, but I've thought it. I've had him say this. Mr. Green, you're not going to drag me to an altar. Mr. Green, you're not going to over persuade me. Mr. Green, you're not going to make me be saved. Mr. Green, I'm going to get saved when I get good and ready. You're not going to get saved when you get good and ready. You're going to get saved when God Almighty draws you by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel. That's where you're going to get saved. And if you think you're going to push God around, and burn the candle of life for the devil and blow the smoke in God's face, you'll find out you'll wake up in hell. You'll not get saved when you get ready. No man can come to me except my Father which sent me drawing, right? And you'll get saved when God convicts you. And if God convicts you tonight and you don't come, you can't prove to me from this book that God's duty bound to ever convict you again. 
the most dangerous thing you've ever done and the most dangerous thing you'll ever do is to feel the urge to come to God and to feel Holy Spirit conviction in your heart and shake your head in God's face and walk away from it. God may never trouble your heart again. Now I want to read a little passage in James 4 and then we're going to discuss that other day. Look at James 4. I can't say but very little about it, but I want to read it. James 4. Verse 12. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow. We will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeared for a little while and then vanishes away. For that ye ought to say, watch it, you ought to say, if the Lord will, if God wills, we shall live. See? Now look at your Bible. Instead of saying we'll go to such a city, we'll stay in that city a year, We'll buy, we'll sell, we'll get gain. Instead of saying that, you should say, if God wills, if it be God's will, we shall live. And if it's not God's will, I won't be alive to do anything tomorrow or the rest of today. So don't say today and don't say tomorrow. Say, if it be God's will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you do rejoice in your boast and all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. To know that you should be saved and refuse to be saved is enough sin to damn you. And all you need to do to be damned is to refuse to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be damned for refusing to believe on him. Is that right? Say The first day on God's calendar is today. And God narrows today, not to 24 hours, but to a few seconds. Now. Right now. Right now. God deals in the eternal right now. Not tomorrow. Not next week. All the yesterdays have been swallowed up in the eternity behind us. All the tomorrows belong to God. All this day is gone until this present minute, second. This day is gone up to this present second. And all that belongs to you is the breath that you are breathing right now. And if you want to be sure not to go to hell, give your heart to Jesus sitting in the seat. Don't wait till I finish this sermon. Now I have about 10 minutes to talk about that day. I'd like for you to turn to Paul's letter to Timothy. Second epistle, chapter 1. Second Timothy, chapter 1. Now, more for my sake than your sake, it's a necessity that I cut my sermon tonight. As you notice, I'm extremely hoarse tonight, and it's this mountain air. I come from South Carolina. The days before I left, it was 97, 98 in the shade. But that's dry air down here. I've been breathing tadpoles and spring lizards ever since I've been here. <laughs> now, some of you look like you think I'm cracked. I am. That's where the light got in. Amen. Beats all I've ever seen in my life. I'm staying in a trailer down here. Lived in a trailer all my life until about six years ago. Pulled one all over this country. And I'm in a trailer down here. And we go to bed at night. 
It's so hot, I'd rather not discuss it. And then you wake up about 4.30 in the morning and you need to turn on the furnace. <laughs> now, I'm not finding fault with your mountains. I thank God for the mountains. You know, I didn't have to come here, you know. I could still be in Greenville. So I'm just telling you why I can't uh, talk. Yeah, I got a throat full of spring lizards. <laughs> 